And we're back on The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers, glad you're with us again this week. This is a show where we meet interesting people and talk about topical issues. And we've got a guest today who's right on the front lines of what's going on in Washington. Indeed, uh, Congresswoman Mary Fallon has been kind enough to give us some time today to talk about the election 2008, what's been going on, what she expects will go on. Uh, this is airing uh, on the 30th of November, so we have a little bit of knowledge about what's going on, but not, not mm -hmm. the uh, type that we will expect after the first of the year after the inauguration, but we're really pleased she'd join us. A lot of transition going on in Washington. It'll be interesting to hear Congresswoman Fallon's take on everything that's going on up there. It's an interesting time. Mary Fallon, today's guest on The Verdict. We'll be right back. Everyday America uses clean burning natural gas instead of coal or oil is a day of victory for our environment. That's why Chesapeake chose to explore for natural gas exclusively, and we've never looked back. Because natural gas burns twice as clean as oil or coal, and reducing carbon emissions to combat potential global warming is every bit as urgent as cutting our dependence on energy imports. As America's number one driller of new gas wells, Chesapeake is moving fast to find untapped reserves of natural gas here at home. It's the right fuel for America's economy and the fuel for a clean air future. We just happen to be early to see it so clearly. Chesapeake, natural gas wins the day. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma working with the owners of small and medium sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers. Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today we're really thrilled to have back for another visit the Honorable Mary Fallon, the Congresswoman from the 5th District of Oklahoma, just recently re-elected to her uh, second term. She, of course, uh, served uh, with distinction in the Oklahoma House of Representatives, then was elected uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor, the first woman and the first Republican elected uh, to the position of Lieutenant Governor in Oklahoma and uh, served there for uh, 12 years and has now m moved on to the uh, uh, House of Representatives in Washington. She's a frequent guest with us and we're really pleased she'd come by and kind of give us her perspective on what we've all just observed in the election 2008. Welcome back. Yeah. Thank you. Glad to be back with you. Glad to have you. Nationally, it was not a good time for a representative to be running on the Republican ticket, but your, re your hard work recognized you clearly uh, won a, a resounding election. So congratulations, well, first of thank, all. Thank but give you. us your overall opinion on, on the way the national uh, scene looks and the way Oklahoma voted. Well, let me, let me just say I'm very humbled to be able to serve Oklahoma another term, and I appreciate the confidence in the people. And it, it was a hard election year for many Republicans nationwide, and Oklahoma certainly voted a lot different than, than the rest of the nation did, and we saw a sweep of the Democrats in many states and congressional seats and other races, and of course here in Oklahoma we saw kind of the opposite to where Oklahoma swept more conservative, more Republican by the House picking up more seats, by the Oklahoma Senate finally being flipped over to Republican control with pro temporary Glenn Coffee taking over. And so it was kind of an interesting time. We saw one statewide elected office switch over from Democrat to Republican with Dana Murphy. 
And then we had some pretty good numbers for Senator Inhofe and myself and Tom Cole and Frank Lucas and John Sullivan. So it's interesting to watch how the nation's going compared to how Oklahoma's going. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, assess the, the shift? I realize uh, you haven't had much time to assess it because it, it hasn't started up particularly yet, but the shift uh, that you're going to experience in the House of Representatives uh, with the new Democrats that will be there replacing some that were formerly Republican. That's right. Well, we did lose some seats. I think it's around 19 so far. There's still some uncontested or contested seats, I should say, elections that we're waiting to hear the final results on. But, but we lost some seats, and um, you know the Republicans years ago had kind of lost their way, in my opinion. That's one of the reasons why I think Mick and I both ran for Congress is that we thought Congress had been spending way too much money. There was too much earmarking. There were some ethical problems on both sides of the aisle, and we still have those challenges. And there were a lot of things moving in this election cycle with, with the war being prolonged, with the national economy taking a, a slump and a hit, and just a president who had been in eight years caused those seats to flip over because people are just weary. They just want to change, as they say. But what will be interesting will be to see with the new members that have been elected to Congress whether um, President-elect Obama will govern from the middle or if he'll govern from the far left. Now his voting record is that he is the most liberal voting member in the U.S. Senate. And so now he's got members on the far left that will be waiting to see if he'll really uh, deliver for the unions, the trial lawyers, some of the environmental activists, the radical type activists, or whether he'll come back to the center and govern with the blue dog Democrats who work well with the Republicans in the U.S. House. And of course for the Republicans, we still have to work on our branding and get back to the basics of what has made mm -hmm. the Republican Party strong. Limited government, uh, fiscal responsibility, you know, strong foundation for, for families, uh, strong national defense, government reform, those types of issues. Go ahead. Dealing as a minority member of Congress, how do you strategize? How do you, you make sure that conservative values or the Republican uh, voices are heard here in the next two years when we've had this swing to the left nationally? Well, nationally, the Republican Party, of course, is having a lot of soul searching right now as to, you know, where do we need to be? And we were doing that all these past two years when we lost so many seats when I came in a couple of years ago. But we've been talking about issues, about where the nation needs to be moving in the future, such as energy independence from foreign oil, holding down spending, keeping taxes low, what we can do to keep, create a pro-growth environment in our national economy. We've been talking about reducing the earmarks, having more transparency, more accountability, uh, reducing health care costs, um, those types of policies. And those are the types of things we're going to have to continue to work on. We're concerned about uh, you know, what's our nation going to do when it comes to our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, we want to make sure that those that those nations are able to secure their own future and we do want the troops to come home as soon as possible but yet we don't want to to uh, risk our future just trying to bring the troops home suddenly so there's going to be a lot of soul searching a lot of discussions going on in Washington and of course a, a whole new ball game. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, in the House <clears throat> while uh, the Republicans did lose some seats it didn't dramatically change the balance because I, they were the Republicans were in the minority at the time, so it's not going to change committee chairs or uh, or the like. Do you think it'll have any uh, uh, market effect on the uh, on the legislation that's passable? Well, the, the big change will be that in the past, when we had major controversial issues like eliminating the secret ballots for unions where people have to show who they're voting for to the union bosses versus being able to vote in secret like, like you and I do in public elections. You know, issues like that or say the windfall profits tax on oil companies, now not having a Republican president but having a Democrat House, Democrat Senate, Democrat president, if they want to pass those types of pieces of legislation and move on those issues, they can do it because there's not a president there who will probably veto those types of things and they'll be able to kind of jam those things through. In the past, President Bush, if they were passed by the House and Senate, President Bush could veto it and we had the numbers to sustain the veto. And uh, so now we're not going to have that. So it's going to be very interesting to see and 
maybe there'll be some opportunities for Republicans and Democrats that are the blue dog, the conservative Democrats, to build some coalitions to work together. I hope so. Do you look for your committee assignments to change? And what's the timing of all of that restructuring? Well, we, we will know shortly what the makeups of the committees will be. The Republicans will actually lose some seats on committees because there were some seats that changed over from Republican to Democrat. I've actually asked for some changes in my committee assignments. I, I love all my committees, and they're all very important, but there are some opportunities for promotion even for me. So I have put in for the possibility of getting on armed services, which would be very important for Oklahoma with Tinker and our military bases, and also for Ways and Means. That's kind of a long shot for a sophomore in Congress, but we're going to try. Mm -hmm. I want to go back a little bit to what some of the trends we saw in the national election with uh, many uh, previously uh, strong Republican states, uh, the uh, Democrats making inroads, and yet that not happening in Oklahoma. Do you think uh, it's uh, a uh, question of the fundamental political persuasion of most Oklahomans? to remain uh, in the Republican camp as, it, as they did? Or, or was this just a super uh, political effort by the Republican Party in Oklahoma? A combination of all those things. You, know, you have to also remember that Oklahoma, registration-wise, we're still registered majority Democrat. We're not registered majority Republican. Right. But we tend to vote Republican because our Democrats, a lot of them are conservative Democrats. They believe in keeping spending low, lower taxes. They believe in faith and family and freedom, you know, things that are important to the Republican Party. So they vote that way. I think it was a great effort by our, our Republican leadership, especially Senator Coffey, uh, Speaker Benj, and recruiting good candidates, talking about issues, talking about where the Republican Party wants to take the state of Oklahoma and, and the other candidates too. And that's why we won some good races and why we continue to have good leadership. But we still have a majority of our statewide elected people in Oklahoma who are Democrat. You know, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the attorney general, the superintendent of, of education, you know, those are all Democrat candidates. So it's, it's kind of a mixed bag here in Oklahoma, but basically we're a conservative state that believes in a strong military and limited spending and being fiscally responsible. and family values. Well put. We're going to take a break. We're visiting with the Honorable Mary Fallon right here on The Verdict. One more segment to go. Stay with us. Most of the artwork that I produce is with colored pencil and watercolor. The subject matter that I use is, of course, Chickasaw. Most of my themes revolve around family and um, really that foundation that has been a part of Chickasaw life since ancient times. The Chickasaw Nation is a matriarchal society. You've got one lady, she's probably the oldest member of the family that everybody goes to and that everybody reveres. That is something that every woman can look forward to in the Chickasaw Nation because they are extremely important in the family. Maybe one day <laughs> I will be a matriarch. I think this is probably the secret to the success of our government is that we still have maintained that idea that family is the most important thing and that uh, we must uh, minister to the family first and then all other things will fall into place. Home values are down in some states, but not in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's home values have increased 4.2% during the past 12 months. Unlike some states where home values have decreased as much as 20%. Good thing you're in Oklahoma. There may be real estate problems in some states, but there has never been a better time than now to buy or sell a home in Oklahoma. One of the most affordable states in the country, Oklahomans are buying and selling homes every day. And an Oklahoma Realtor can show you how. Good thing you're in Oklahoma. That land next door was a mess. Take more than a lawnmower to revive that land. I heard the oil and natural gas people was cleaning up old oil sites, and it wouldn't cost us a flood nickel. Oh, yes, sir, it was quite a revival. The whole church showed up, want to make a playground for the kids. <laughs> it sure is a blessing.
Welcome back to The Verdict. We're visiting with the Honorable Mary Fallon, the 5th District Representative in the uh, U.S. House of Representatives. Well, we're going to have a Democratic president. We know we're going to have a Democrat that has a majority in the Senate and a Democrat majority in the House. Um, so how do you deal with that? And, and, and strategically, you know, what happens next when they've got all three branches? Well, I think there's a lot of talk going on right now about bipartisanship and the need to work together, especially with our country facing some of the challenges it's facing right now. You know, people are worried about their jobs, they're worried about their income, they're worried about paying for college, they're worried about paying for health care, or they're glad that gas prices have finally come down a little bit. But people are more concerned about how we can work together in Washington to solve their daily issues and their problems. and. And that's what I hope we can do is build some bipartisan support between the two and work on the issues that uh, we have in common. Now, I will tell you, though, that if I see issues I think are going to harm the country, then I'll be out there fighting against those types of things. Uh, we heard both candidates talk a lot about bipartisanship and how important it would be, and uh, particularly in this economic uh, time of, of trouble that we're experiencing. Do you expect to see Republicans appointed in the Obama administration, and if so, do you have any idea about who those people might be? Well, there, there have been a couple of people mentioned, mainly from the U.S. Senate, that have served with uh, President-elect Obama, so we may see some. He would be wise to appoint some Republicans to his administration just to send a signal that he really is going to keep his word on trying to work across bipartisan lines. Of course, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see who all those people will be. and. I, I was a little disappointed with his choice and his chief of staff. I serve with Congressman Rahm Emanuel, and he's, he's known to be a, a ruthless man and not a person who builds upon bipartisan relationships. So that was a little disappointing to see the first person out of the box that President Obama would uh, appoint would be him. Not a fence mender. Huh? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> what do you see as the major challenges in the state of Oklahoma on the near term? Well, I think in the state of Oklahoma, we want to make sure that our economy maintains its strength. We're having a little bit of, of, a, of a downturn, maybe a little bit of an adjustment in Oklahoma with some of our businesses. We're seeing some businesses that are beginning to cut back. With the price of oil dropping, I want to make sure that we keep our budget in good condition in the state of Oklahoma. Anytime revenues drop from the oil industry, that can certainly affect the uh, amount of money that's available for government services and infrastructure and education and those types of things in Oklahoma. So good fiscal responsibility is important for our future, working on creating more jobs and opportunities. And you certainly mm -hmm. have done a great job, Mayor, here in Oklahoma City, especially with our new MBA team and the thunder coming to Oklahoma City. And I'm hoping we can attract more businesses like that. Of course, in the legislature, and I'm not there, but I hope they can work on issues like workers' compensation reform, some lawsuit reform, continue to work on keeping taxes low, health care type issues, work on issues to protect our families. Now, those will be issues I could see our Oklahoma legislature focusing on. Let me ask you a question that I ought to know the answer to, uh, but I haven't done the looking at the numbers. Uh, if, if lawsuit reform would pass uh, both the uh, House of Representatives and the Oklahoma State Senate, and then be uh, vetoed uh, by the Democratic governor. Is there a, a majority enough in uh, the, the uh, two houses to override a veto? You know, I gotta think about that too. I think it's, if I remember right, uh, two-thirds. Two -thirds, so I don't think there'd be the numbers on that. But at least not in the Senate. Not I don't in know the Senate, the House. yeah. At least not by a partisanship line. It, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah, it would have, it would have to be a bipartisan yeah. movement between the two. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, there's, there's some possibility, I guess, but I bet the governor wouldn't sign it. What's the long-term benefit to a, a, a president or a governor uh, or an executive leader uh, engaging in bipartisanship? What do they gain by doing that that, uh, that tells the people something about themselves? Well, they get things done. You know, when, when you can find common ground to work together and share that vision with with the public and get the public to buy into whatever the vision might be and then recruiting both sides to work together. I always did that when I was in the Oklahoma House a long time ago. I was able to get uh, 16 bills passed in, in the four years I was in the Oklahoma House and there were only around 30 Republicans out of 101 members so we didn't even come close to having numbers to get bills passed. And then when I was Lieutenant Governor I worked on workers comp 
and uh, purchasing reform and I had Democrats in the House and in the Senate that helped me carry those bills because they controlled the House and Senate here in Oklahoma. So when you work together on issues and you have a shared vision, you can do great things for your state or even your nation. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. What, what stages do you see in the in, 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 in as Obama and we're taping this uh, in November and many people won't see this show until early December but uh, a lot of talk about uh, who Obama will put in his cabinet what's your thoughts as we tape today what's your thoughts about the, those decisions that he and his staff have to make well whoever he puts in his cabinet those are very important decisions and of course it will determine a lot about the bipartisanship too if he should appoint some Republicans and, and frankly even some of the Democrats that he appoints and, and I you know, know he'll have a majority of them be Democrats but like I mentioned the, the chief of staff that he's appointed we know he's not he's, he's a partisan uh, player in Congress we know he won't be particularly bipartisan so that does not send a good signal for the beginning of a term but I hope in the cabinet that he'll have a, a great mixture of people whether it's women men uh, all the different races. I, I expect to probably see a, a kind of a, a different type of makeup of a cabinet and that's not bad for America, it's a good thing. Let me ask you about an individual that I know that you know, um, uh, I don't, but you do, uh, Robert Gates, the Secretary of Defense. You've been uh, over into the Middle East a number of times and uh, I have heard a number of reports that uh, Gates gets pretty high marks from both sides of the aisle and that he may be asked to stay on either permanently or on for a year or so, but what's your, what's your sense of that as Gates as continuing on as Secretary of Defense? I, I think it would be good for the nation, especially at a critical time when we're talking about troop withdrawal out of, out of Iraq and of course the uh, challenges that we still have in Afghanistan, if we could have that consistency with Secretary Gates staying in his current position. And there has been talk about him staying on, which I was very encouraged to see. What I have found in the uh, classified briefings I've been to or my travels to the Middle East is that the, the military um, generals, the people like Secretary Gates, the ambassadors, that they try not to be partisan in their politics. They try to be strictly about governing the nation and about what's best for the United States. And there are plenty of good men and women out there that are career politicians or, or I should say career um, administrators within the system that uh, President-elect Obama can certainly choose from and, and I hope he will do that. Mm -hmm. When you were out in your district uh, campaigning here recently, uh, I know there had to be a lot of talk about uh, the response to the economy the, and the economic problems and uh, the, the so-called bailout. And I know when it's called a bailout, there's a reluctance from the general public, and rightfully so, to think that that's a good idea. But it, it seems to be one of those issues with the, the more people understand, the more information people get, there's a higher level of acceptance. How successful do you think you were in communicating why that was the right decision to do for America? Well, I have to say that that was probably one of the toughest decisions I've ever had to make, uh, besides just working with my children on something. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, when you talk about people's jobs, and you talk about their 401ks and their retirement funds or people's investments or company stock holdings or uh, in investments in, of all sorts, and you talk about asking taxpayers to help out to and, and then try to try to say and, and, and prove that they'll get their money back at some point in time when they make an investment back in the economy with the rescue package as, as it's been labeled now, you know, that was a tough vote for all of us and, and I did not feel like the first package that we were presented had enough accountability or transparency or safeguards in it to really do what I thought it should do. And of course it failed the first time and, and I was on the House floor when that vote was going on and it was kind of a prolonged vote. It took about 30 minutes probably and there was some arm twisting going on when the votes failed. And I was sitting there on the floor and they were talking about the stock market. So it was down 200, down 300, down 400, <laughs> down 500, down 700. And I'm going, oh my gosh, you know, I just voted against that. And I'm, the stock market's falling and people are losing money. And I mean, that really hits you because you know that the decision that you're making is important and critical to people's future and their jobs. And of course, that vote went down. But in the end, the Senate came back and the House later met and we came up with a, a better package still not perfect but much better and uh, the money was had more accountability more transparency 
There were actually some tax credits, some tax cuts. The alternative minimum tax was put in the second bill. Uh, some renewable energy tax credits, the Indian land tax credit, which is important. So it was better. Thank you very much. We are out of time. Thank you so much but for coming. Please on the come show. back. You're Kent and I'll have a final word right after this. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma, loyal to you. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers wrapping up a show with the Honorable Mary Fallon. We want to give some website information. You can reach Mary at www.fallon.house.gov. And you can go to our website and tell us about a show you'd like to see right here on The Verdict. For Kent, I'm Mick, and we'll see you next week. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel. No, not in this oh, next segment. Though. No, Probably in the in the segment when I'm Mark's sorry. on. In the first guest segment. Yes. Okay, you want to go ahead and take it now?